Hey guys, uh, tonight we don't have a guest, but I'm going to be reading from that book we read from every week called The History and Haunting of Salem, The Witch Trials and Beyond by Rebecca F. Pittman. See you in about five minutes. Grab your popcorn and snacks, find a comfy spot, take a seat or lie down, and let me transport you to a place of fantasy, ghost stories, ancient legends, odd creatures, alien encounters, and other magical topics. 
You may even decide to join the conversation. From faraway lands to your own backyard, with a small dash of pixie dust, turn out the lights and open your minds. The journey is about to begin. Hey everybody, how's everybody doing? Sorry for the late start tonight. Had some issues and uh, hopefully they're resolved. If not, I might have to get up in the middle of the show and take care of something. But uh, yeah, it's been an interesting day for issues. Like Murphy's Law all day. My name is Charlotte. I'm going to be your host. Hey, guys. That was weird, wasn't it? Uh, my name is Charlotte. I'm going to be your host for the next hour. <laughs> got some weird things going on. At least we got through the intro to the show this time without having it stop. Okay? So we're just going to be thankful for that. Um, welcome. Uh, this is California Haunts Radio, and I am your host. Host is host. Uh, hopefully we'll be here for an hour or more, a little bit over an hour, because we're starting a little late tonight. Um, we're going to be reading the book, and uh, we read this book usually every Sunday night, it's every Sunday evening to get us ready for the work week, you know, and so everybody relaxes. So you don't have to sit there and watch me read the book. You can, however, just kind of hang out, you know, and uh, eat your dinner and uh, uh, put your slippers on and your PJs and all that and just kind of hang out and just listen. Maybe turn the lights off. Close your eyes and listen to me read. You know, it's cool. Just a word of warning with this book is it's very detailed. However, it is written in uh, 1600s English. So I do have trouble <laughs> with some of the stuff in there. And I'll point it out. I, even I laugh at it when I'm doing it. So I'll point it out as I go when I, when I have trouble. Because, yeah, this book is about the Salem witch trials and the aftermath of those witch trials. And uh, so far in this book, we've seen a lot of people uh, go to court and a lot of people get hung. In fact, just, uh, just Sunday, I believe, if I remember right, eight people got hung. And we're talking men and women. So, brutal time, brutal time. God forbid you had psychic abilities or you, you like to work with herbs or anything. Anyway, you can find us on Facebook. You can find us at Twitter. You can find us on TikTok. You can find us on Instagram and at Facebook, uh, Redwood California Haunts and my name. And uh, if you haven't done so already and you like what you hear tonight, uh, please be sure to hit that follow button and hit the like button. Show me some love. Let me, you know, let me know you like it. OK, same thing with, with uh, YouTube. If you're watching from YouTube tonight, there's that ghost. Look, I can't even aim right tonight. There it is. <laughs> there's that ghost right there in the bottom right hand corner. And that ghost is our mascot. If you click on that ghost, uh, the subscribe button will come up and you can subscribe to our to our shows if you haven't done so already which this what subscribe means is that you will get notified when we have a new show okay so yeah and uh you can also show us show me some love over there too if you like what you hear like i said tonight but um welcome everybody um take a look at me on instagram i am ghosty gal all over cased and i am california haunts over on tiktok and i am cal haunts on <laughs> I'm tired tonight. You can tell it's been a long day. I'm Cal Haunts on Twitter. Okay, so that's the way to find us if you're if you're if you're actually looking for us. Now over on YouTube at youtube.com forward slash at Hamper that's the ampersand California Haunts Radio. We have 535 videos over there, and uh, I, everybody knows well pretty much everybody knows that I'm a journalist by trade, and so I don't like to always do paranormal stuff. I like to do other things as well. So, for instance, uh, what the night before last, we had uh, the story of a, uh, of a teenage murderer. The night before that, we were talking about sociopaths. So, I mean, there's different things on there. So, if you look through those 535 videos, you're, you're, you're probably going to find something that you like. Okay? And that's just what I'm saying. All right. This book written by Rebecca F. Pittman is an interesting book. Uh, Rebecca is very detail-oriented. And like I said, she's going, you know, in this book, using, utilizing this book, she's going through archives. There's other books out on the subject that, that, that she got stuff from, which she, she, she says readily that she got stuff from these other books. And there's also court records that she's found. And sometimes they're incomplete. So she'll say that straight out as I'm reading. It'll say, you know, these are incomplete. So we do the best we can. And like I said, if, if I come across a spelling on anything that I don't get right, I'll usually laugh and tell you guys. I'll even spell it out for you guys so you guys can see the hell I'm going through trying to get through this book. But it's an excellent book. She reminds me of me because she's so detail-oriented. Okay? All right. So without further ado, let me get my tablet on, and away we go. So I'm going to try and read for about an hour. And um, let me unplug here. 
I have a really old tablet, so you got to bear with me. Um, I'm going to try and read for about an hour. And like I said, you don't have to watch me read. Have your dinner, sit back, you know, sit by the fire or whatever it is you do when you're, when, when you relax and think of it that way. Think of it like an audio book you get when you're driving your car across country or whatever, or you're on vacation or whatever. Okay. So here we go. Well, we'll wait for it to come up. But I hope everybody had a good day. We're almost to Friday. One more day tomorrow. Nancy Matz is going to be with us and we're going to be talking about twin flames and, and, uh, that sort of thing. So hopefully you'll join us for that. That hopefully will be at the right time tomorrow. And again, um, if I have to leave in the middle of the show, I have to leave in the middle of the show. There's no choice in the matter because I've got stuff going on in, in the background here. So, okay, let me power this up. We are on day 13 of this book. So we've done 13 Sundays or 13 readings of this book. We're all, we're about, we're a little past halfway with it. It's a pretty good sized book. So here we go. Google Play services error. That's kind of frightening. Oh, we went black. It went black. Don't do this to me. There we go. Oh, now I was in there and now I'm out. Okay. Okay, we are at, oh, wow. Come on, don't do that stuff. Thank you. Okay, we are at chapter 31. This thing's like acting like it's possessed. Hang on. Let me get this ready. Okay. We're at chapter 31 right now, uh, Terror and Andover. To give you an idea, we're at page 379 of 634. So we're at 61% right now. Okay, so The History and Haunting of Salem, The Witch Trials and Beyond is the book written by Rebecca F. Pittman. I have permission to read this book from the publisher and from Rebecca. So here we go. Chapter 31, Tara and Andover. As oppressiveness, as oppressiveness lay thick in the air, like sodden clouds threatening to burst. I'm sorry, I read it wrong already. See, I'm already starting off the bang. And oppressiveness lay thick in the air, like sodden clouds threatening to burst. Hands faltered in the daily... Let me do something here real quick. Hands faltered in the daily kneading of bread dough. Tongues, once frantic with gossip, were suddenly still. The Bible pages were searched anew in hopes of validation for what they had done. Even the clouds hanging low and gray in the summer sky, reverberated with Shakespeare's quote from almost a century earlier. Quote, A glooming peace this morning with it, with it brings. The sun for sorrow will not show its head. Go hence to have more talk of these sad things. Some shall be pardoned and some punished. For never was a story of more woe. Romeo and Juliet, 1595. Francis Nurse, much in years, gathered his family around him. His wife, Rebecca, lay beneath the freshly turned earth at the bottom of the small slope outside their home. Each sound of an approaching horse brought fear to the inhabitants of the large farmhouse. Would there be retribution for carrying away the body? The body? Now, with a convicted family witch, newly executed, would more of them be taken away? Other entire families had fallen beneath that sword. Their two aunts, Mary Etsy and Sarah Cloyce, were still imprisoned, awaiting their trials. The knocks at their door were those of friends bearing food and words of comfort, some sitting in silence with the family or sobbing softly. There were no words that could shine any light of reason upon this travesty of justice. It was a frightening, anxious feeling that hung like the scent of drying herbs beneath the, the beam ceilings. While the small world of Salem Village turned in the dazed aftermath of the hangings, some of the accused took action. The hanging spurred a panic among those waiting for a trial that promised no reprieve from the gallows. It was those with money who decided the heck with justice. John Alden, who had been examined and found probably guilty of witchcraft on May 28th, had been given permission to await his trial under house arrest. His reputation as the credited soldier in the Indian Wars had not been forgotten. His father and mother were John and Priscilla Alden who would later be made famous as the romance of the Plymouth Landing era. Unfortunately for John Jr., he was a tall man from Boston, the very criteria needed to satisfy Tatuba's description of the man who forced her to sign his book way back in February. The justice system seemed to swing between accusing George Burroughs, swarthly skinned black man, and John Alden, tall man from Boston, as the person to whom Tatuba attributed her tortures. Burroughs was now supposedly the ringleader of the witches, but not the devil. 
What role did John Alden play in that chessboard of evil? The day after the hangings, a group gathered in John Alden's home for a day of fasting and prayer. Samuel Willard and Cotton Mather bent their heads with the anxious Alden. Judge Samuel Sewell was also in attendance and noted in his diary that the clouds suddenly burst open in a brave shower of rain. Sewell offered a prayer himself, a show of support for the prisoner. As John Alden thought over his predicament, weighing whether to flee or face his accusers, others of the accused opened their purses and fled. Nathaniel Carey was the first to take action. He had watched the examination against his wife and found it a cruel mockery. The sobering reality of the hangs finally prompted him to facilitate her escape. On July 30th, whether he bribed a guard or found a means to smuggle her out, Carey spirited her away to Rhode Island. Fearing that was still too close to the proceedings and hearing rumors that they were being pursued, the Careys headed to New York. Sarah and Edward Bishop, their names so closely aligned with the executed Bridget Bishop, decided not to wait for a uh, decided not to wait for a vanilla, uh, blech, excuse me, decided not to wait for a, I cannot say the word, a vanilla, a vanilla. Why can't I say this word? Execute British Bishop decided not to wait for a benevolent outcome. Oh, I can't say that word. They escaped and went into hiding. Mary and Philip English, also given better conditions than the other accused witches, were under guard in Boston and allowed some freedom during the daytime. The fact that they were friends with Governor Phipps and his wife improved their situation. Thus, under what had been mixed feelings among the congregation, they attended church to hear Reverend Joshua Moody pontificate on a rather interesting subject. Moody, no supporter of the witch trials, murmur okay, Moody, no, no supporter of the witch trials, murmuring against respected and prominent citizens, realized the dire straits in which Philip and Mary English found themselves. There were already murmurings concerning perceived prejudice in the judicial system. Why was it that the elite, such as ex-John Saltonstall, of whom the girls had cried against once, once he denounced their theatrics, had not been imprisoned? The judges would be hesitant to let English go, a man who had been accused of wizardry and spoken out against the fakery of the girls. Reverend Moody took the pulpit and looked down at the haggard faces of Philip and Marion. Many were whispering behind their backs. How dare these accused people appear in church? It was blasphemy. In words that were intended for the English's ears, he quoted from Matthew 10, 23. Quote, If they persecute you in one city, flee to another. He continued on with a sermon that did little to mask his meaning. Perhaps he felt safer in Boston than he would have preaching such scripture in Salem Village. After the meeting, he and Samuel Willard visited with Philip and Mary and tossing su subtlety to the wind, urged them to escape. Philip resisted. Not only would running show as an indication of guilt, but his wealth of possessions would fall into the hands of Sheriff George Kerwin, and English had many possessions. He would also forfeit the 4,000-pound bail that had allowed he, his wife Mary, and their six-year-old daughter Susanna to stay in better quarters in the Boston prison jailkeeper's house. It also allowed them freedom during the day, as long as they returned at night. God will not permit them to touch me, he said, with less confidence than he was feeling. His wife Mary, who had endured more prison time than he, and was even now sick with consumption from the inhumane prison conditions, urged him to reconsider. Do you not think the sufferer is innocent, she pleaded? Why not when we suffer also? Moody and Willard finally pressed him. If he would not look after his wife's well-being, they would carry her away. He finally capitulated. A letter of recommendation was hastily drawn up and a carriage sent for a carriage sent for from Sir Benjamin Fletcher of New York. The letter admonished, admonished <laughs> the letter admonished that Mrs. English was to be shown every courtesy. Once Philip agreed to go as well, his name and others were added. New York under the influence of the Dutch, was not suffering the witchcraft malady and suddenly found itself harboring refugees from the noose. Andover's witches. In Andover, Massachusetts, the wife of Joseph Ballard lay in her bed, an invalid of many months. Local doctors had been brought in, but no remedy seemed to help her. With the witch hysteria going on in Salem, some began to look with fresh eyes at their loved ones dealing with fevers, aches, 
and other maladies. The afflicted girls of Salem Village had developed a reputation for their ability to see into the invisible world and pluck out the witches tormenting the poor souls of God-fearing people. Their efforts had resulted already in ridding the Massachusetts Bay Colony of six accomplices of Satan. It was therefore decided to bring two of the more gifted seers to Andover to see if they could discern who was afflicting their sickly. The people of that town backed the decision of Joseph Ballard to bring in two of the girls, and a man was sent to fetch them. Anne Putnam, Jr., although only 12 years of age, and Mary Walcott stepped into the cart and rode into Andover like rock stars. Villagers with ailing relatives were eagerly awaiting their arrival. They set up sick rooms in readiness. For the two girls, this was a heady experience. The, the reverence with which they were met outshone those in Salem, town and village, who had, were beginning to scold them as liars. Anne and Mary were led into the house where they went into their trances and confirmed the fears of Andover that there were witches sitting at the headboards and feet of the infirmed. To add to the ominous import of their visions, upon hearing there were witches among them, the younger inhabitants of the homes would suddenly fall into convulsions, their eyes open to the invisible world as well. But then, a predicament presented itself. Anne and Mary had never been to Andover. Unlike Salem Village, they were ignorant of the local gossip or the names of the usual suspects. In short, when asked, who was afflicting the bedridden victims, they faltered. It seems the girls were always able to skate away from anything that came close to the unveiling of their trickery. Rather than look at, askance at the afflicted dues inability to name names, the good people of Andover, along with most of the church deacons and Reverend Thomas Bernard, decided to conduct an experiment that would save time in discovering the witches of their town. They placed the two girls into the front of the Andover meeting house. Anne and Mary were still showing symptoms of their trances and afflictions garnered during their ordeal of going into so many houses and witnessing such a variety of witches. This was a perfect setting of the touch test. No matter that the girls didn't know the names of the witches, they could touch them and cry out. A number of people from Andover were rounded up and taken to the meeting house where they were blindfolded. Some were the typical village miscreants, vagabonds like Sarah Good. Others or the fodder of gossip of one kind or another. To be fair, other citizens without blemish were added to the lineup to give an impartial reading. One by one, they were led to the two girls, and their hands placed in the hands of the afflicted. If, at that point of touch, either of the girls was suddenly cured of her symptoms, the person was accused of being a witch. Simple enough, but the test went afoul. The church deacons figured, Hi, Pamela. The church deacons figured a handful of people might fall beneath the test. But to their astonishment and horror, almost every person failed. Former Deputy Dudley Bradstreet, who was responsible for Essex County, found himself suddenly writing out 40 arrest warrants on the charges of witchcraft. As more people were placed before the gifted hands of the duo from Salem Village, other names were added. In exasperation, Bradstreet set down his quill and declared he could not, with good conscience, write out any more warrants based on this type of evidence. The bloodthirsty among the gathering may have reminded him that Martha Carrier, the Queen of Hell, was a resident of Andover and even now was awaiting her trial. If one of Satan's leaders had lived among them, how many more might be passing themselves off as humble villagers? Andover would soon have its first confessed witch. Widow Ann Foster was brought before the bar in Salem Village on a complaint of witchcraft, possibly from Joseph Ballard. At first, Goody Foster denied the charges, but she had not accounted for the gallery of afflicted girls and their outbursts. Mary Walcott, Mary Warren, Elizabeth Hubbard, and Ann Putnam Jr. all screamed that she was pinching and choking them. Beneath such an unnerving assault, she admitted that, yes, the devil had come to her almost half a year since as usual. When the girls heard a confession in the works, they quieted and watched with a mixture of confusion. This woman was admitting to their accusations. And the thrill of the kill. Foster said the devil had appeared to her in the form of a white feathered bird with large eyes that sat upon her table and promised her, like the tuba, many pretty things. It had finally vanished away black, and she found herself able to afflict others 
with only her glance. Foster then laid the blame at Martha Carrier's feet, the renowned witch of Andover. It was Martha, Foster said, who told her to hurt the girl seated to her left. That same day, Goody Foster's granddaughter, Mary Lacey Jr., was accused by Timothy Swan of tormenting him. And Foster was held over in Salem Jail, where Reverend Hale questioned her further. She admitted she had actually been in the devil's company for six years, not six months. She testified to attending the devil's picnics on the Salem Village Parsons grounds, where George Burroughs and Martha Carrier held court. She said that now, due to her confessions, their specters had appeared to her from different parts of the prison and threatened to stab her to death with a sharp pointed iron like spindle, but four square. Meanwhile, back in Andover, 40 people who had awakened that day to their ordinary routines were now accused as witches. Six of the women drew up a deposition stating we were all exceedingly astonished and amazed and, and consternated and affrighted, even out of reason. Suddenly, these accused men and women were going over details of their past days, searching for some clue that might show the devil had invaded their home or spirit. As always, the Puritan mantra that it must be due to their own sin or shortcoming kept them searching for their failings. They remembered trivialities from eons past. Could that be when the devil saw a fissure in their righteousness? And over Denison and confessor to witchcraft, William Barker, announced that he could understand why Salem Village had come under attack. Salem, he declared, was cursed by reason of the people being divided and their differing with him with the minister. He went on to say that he was fed up with the Puritan's obsession with damnation and hierarchy of the elite. Blasphemy be damned. He said he was seduced by the devil for at least under his rule. All men were equal and lived, bra and lived bravely. And then he dropped his bombshell, perhaps almost gleefully. He claimed he knew the exact number of witches flying about Essex County. 307. That didn't include Connecticut's coven who had mounted poles and flown up to Massachusetts to help with the overthrow of churches. Under warrants, others from Andover were taken to Salem Village and placed in jail to await their initial examination. The official court of Warrior and Terminer had returned to their various homes after the hangings of July 19th. One after the other of the Andover accused witches confessed, largely due to pressure from their kinfolk, hoping they would be spared the gallows and some believing their dear spouses must be witches after all. Samuel Wardell, William Barker, Ann Foster, her daughter Mary Lacey, and her granddaughter of the same name, all confessed before the magistrate's relentless barrage of questions. The poignant case of Mary Tyler of Andover shows the battery of pleadings for her to confess. As she rode to Salem Village for her examination, her brother and schoolmaster John Emerson accompanied her ostensibly for, for support, but as they rode, flanking her on either side, they hounded her to confess, to the point that she wished herself in the dungeon than to be so treated. Emerson reached over to her face and parodied beating the devil away from her. When she remained stoic in her resolve, he pulled up on his horse and said, Well, I see you will not confess. I will now leave you, and then you are undone, body and soul together. After his departure, her brother took up the suit and rallied against her in the ultimate act of betrayal. If you confess, you cannot lie, he told her. In tears, Mary cried, Good brother, do not say so, for I shall lie if I confess. And who shall answer to God for my lie? It was her brother's retort that that was like, sounding, like the sounding bell of so many others caught up in the witchcraft chaos. He said, God would not suffer. So many good men to be in error about it. Beneath his long and violent threats of hanging and the spectacle of the meeting house examination, Mary broke down and confessed. Later, in jail, away from her brother and the magistrates and with wailing of young women, she recanted her confession rather than belaying herself. Belying herself. Samuel Wardwell, when given time and perhaps counsel from other accused men, also recanted his confession. Abigail Faulkner, whose father, Francis Dane, was urgently trying to reason with the inhabitants of Andover as to the ludicrousness of what was happening to them, would not confess, no matter how much pressure was brought upon her. The only thing she would admit to 
was that during the touch test in the meeting house in Andover, when she was told to clasp the afflicted's hands, she had, in defiance, struck her hands together. Perhaps the devil may have taken advantage at her act of irritation, she said, but it was the devil and not I who afflicted them. Andover was a different target than Salem Village. The evil had not crept up on it slowly. Like an insidious kudza vine of the south, crawling and snaking its way along until it devoured everything in sight. With the arrival of Ann Putnam Jr. and Mary Walcott, events happened so quickly that people had scant time to react, other than to panic. The recruits, the two Salem Village seers, left behind when they headed home, acted fast, fueled with the drama of what they had seen. Young women cried out on neighbors and animals in a flurry of accusations. John Bradstreet of Vandover, brother of the, of the Bradstreet who suddenly refused to sign any more arrest warrants, was accused of bewitching a dog on the street. Not waiting to be hauled into jail, he fled to New Hampshire. When his brother, Deputy Dudley Bradstreet, was cried out upon, not doubt, parentheses, not doubt, and retribution for deserting his post during the arrest warrant, Debacle. He too left town and went into hiding with his wife. Afflicted girls had said they had spectral evidence confirming the Bradstreet couple had killed people. The Andover incident produced something not yet utilized. Its effectiveness and legal ramifications should have been used long before. When some of the girls from that town cried out on a prominent man from Boston, it set off a hailstorm. Enough was enough. Thought to be Robert Califf, the man who took action and sent a writ to arrest these accusers in 1,000 pound action of, defam of defamation. Defamation of character? 17th century slander at its finest. No one, not even some of the magistrates the girls in Salem Village had gone after, thought to use the legal system for anything other than hanging witches. The writ had its effect. A thousand pounds was a lot of money. Caliph had friends at Andover ass assigned to watch the girls in question. The outcry came to a slow but final halt. Andover benefited by the rapid rise and fall of the witchcraft hysteria there, even though 50 other citizens were already in jails and facing hangings. Should, or facing hanging, should they be found guilty? Andover would carry the distinction of having more accused witches than the Salem province. Old Francis Dane, the father of accused witch Abigail Faulkner, became the sounding board of reason. Through his proclamations, Andover quickly recovered from the delusion it had been under. But now what? Fifty other people would go before a court who had shown no mercy to even the most devout Puritans. It was a hanging committee that would, be, that would interview six more prisoners in early August, and as it would be seen in only a few short weeks, one that would head for the gallows once again. Chapter 32, The King and Queen of Hell while Andover wrestled, literally, with its demons, Salem Town was still busy hearing testimony against various prisoners. The next court of warrior and terminer would begin soon, and depositions and witnesses had to be examined in preparation for it. Several of these examinations were held in Thomas Beadle's Tavern. 77-year-old Mary Bradbury was brought before the magistrates and the afflicted girls. The documents from this inquisition are lost, but for a few fragments contained in depositions. Bradley Hale from Salisbury, the wife of Thomas Brad Bradbury, I'm sorry I said it wrong, sorry, a prominent resident of that town and a militia captain, she had been accused by the girls on May 26th, but not arrested for another month, perhaps due to her husband's influence. During her examination, Anne Putnam Jr., Mary Walcott, Elizabeth Hubbard, Sarah Bibber, and Mary Warren all tumbled about and howled on cue. It may have been Anne Jr. who instigated the arrest for Mary Bradbury. Salisbury was also the hometown of Ann Carr Putnam Sr., and it's possible Ann Jr. had heard her mother speak of the woman before. Had the Bradbury shunned Ann Sr., or was their wealth a source of jealousy to a woman who had been denied her own inheritance? It may have been no coincidence that Ann Jr. claimed to see a vision of her uncle John Carr in a winding sheet, telling her that Miss Bradbury had, had murdered him and that his blood did cry for vengeance against her. Seventy-year-old Anne Punitor had been questioned before. 
she was brought in again to hear witness from Sarah Chur Churchill, who accused her of bringing the devil's book to her on June 1st. Anne swore she had never seen Churchill in her life. Another witness, Jeremiah Neal, was then brought forward with stronger stuff. He charged, he, he charged Peter with murdering his wife after often threatening to kill her. When the afflicted went into their fits, the ever-popular touch test was administered. Mary Warren was cured immediately after touching Pewter's wrist. Mary Walcott put on the finishes, the finishes touches by adding she had seen Pewter's specter in the company of Rebecca Nurse, who had, who had been hung for witchcraft. Anne Pewter and Mary Bradbury were taken to Salem Jail. While the magistrates were gathered at Beadle's Tavern, they decided to hear more cases. On Friday, July 1st, Thomas Putnam and his cousin John Jr. charged Margaret Hawks and her slave Candy for tormenting Mary Walcott, Mary Warren, and Ann Putnam Jr. They had come to Salem Town by way of Barbados. It was during Candy's examination that a new technique to discover witchery was employed. Candy had turned on her mistress after being accused along with her. She told the court that Margaret Hawks had made her a witch and given her two puppets with which to torment people. She held up the dolls, and the afflicted went into hysteria. It was documented that Warren, Deliverance, and Abigail Hobbs were greatly affrighted and fell into violent fits. Judge, Haw Judge Hawthorne noted that all of them said the black man. Mrs. Hawks and the Negro stood, stood by the puppets or rags and pinched them, and then they were afflicted. Let's remember that this is 1600s language, you guys. So I do not want to offend anybody. I'm just reading it as written. Okay? We'll leave it at that. To the surprise of all, the magistrates, along with Nichols, Nicholas Noyes, decided to perform some experiments that had not been done before. They took one of Candy's poppets and burned a portion of it. The afflicted girls screamed out that they had been burned. Noyes dunked the other poppet into a container of water and the girls began choking as if they were drowning. One of them jumped up dramatically and ran from the building toward the river, as if to drown herself. It was one of the more visual effects they had seen, almost scientific under the controlled conditions by which it was executed. Needless to say, Margaret Hawks and Candy joined the others inside the crowded prison. By mid-July, the court of warrior and terminer were slurred were slewing through the old I guess it's slewing through the old depositions and some new ones. After the hangings, the new accusations in Salem Village slowed, only to have the onslaught of prisoners from Andover right in. That Salem Village's calling of new names had dwindled at this time did not mean the afflicted had stopped complaining of spectral attacks from the witches they had already put into prison weeks and months before. As if to make sure their charges stuck in the face of new official trial hearings, they reminded the magistrates of attacks from Burroughs, Carrier, Foster, and others. It was obvious the hangings had done nothing to slake their appetite for death. Mary Lacey Jr. from Andover, who had confessed and been only recently incarcerated, along with her mother, Mary Lacey Sr., whose brother had tormented her until she confessed to being a witch, gave enough damning evidence against Carrier and Burroughs to hang them. She also cried out against Richard Carrier and Andrew Carrier, claiming they were also witches. How many witches had Martha Carrier bewitched to death? The magistrate asked the willing Mary Lacey Jr. The girl named Seven, involving men, women, and children. When asked how she had killed them, Mary answered, she stabbed them to the heart with pins, needles, and knitting needles, both on their bodies and through the use of poppets. The magistrates then went to the crux of the issue with special evidence, and the devil using the shapes of innocent people without their consent. They asked Mary Jr., Do you hear the devil do you hear the devil hurts in the shape of any person without their consent? Mary answered no. Encouraged, hoping to refute Samuel Willard and other, cler and other clergymen's objections from the prior month, they asked, When any person strikes S T R I K S, see, strikes with a sword or staff at a spirit or specter, will that hurt the body? Parentheses. How many testimonials have been born against prisoners pointing out tears in their clothing and cuts on their person from being struck during a spectral visit? End parentheses. Yes, Mary answered, and then through her mother 
and grandmother under the wagon cart by saying they both had been injured in such a matter within Salem Village recently. Wanting to tighten the noose around Burroughs and Carrier's neck, Hawthorne zeroed in and asked for more information about the two prisoners, whose trial was to begin shortly. Mary willingly added to their pyre. Goody Carrier told me the devil said to her she should be queen in hell, and the minister would be king. What kind of man is Mr. Burroughs? they asked her. Why, a pretty, why, a pretty little man, and he has come to us sometimes in his spirit in the shape of a cat, and I think sometimes in his proper shape. Mary Warren, who had obligingly suffered with fits initially during Mary Lacey Jr.'s inter interrogation, softened and took the girl's hands in her own without suffering any harm. The scribe that day for the questioning said, Mary Lacey did earnestly ask Mary Warren forgiveness for afflicting of, of her and both fell a weeping together. Lacey Jr.'s mother was called for, and the emotional daughter begged her to repent and call upon God. Ann Foster, Lacey Jr.'s grandmother, was brought in, and although uncooperative at first, concurred with her granddaughter that Martha Carrier was responsible for many deaths. She added that Mary Ellen Toothaker, whose husband had just passed away in prison awaiting his trial for witchcraft, and her daughter Martha Emerson were both in attendance at the Devil's Picnic in Paris's pasture, and it was here that both Lacey's and Foster signed the Devil's Book. At that point, Mary Warren fell into a fit and cried out against Richard Carrier. An arrest warrant was issued for him on the spot. Richard Carrier was only 18 years old. His brother Andrew, several years younger, was also rounded up and put into jail. With their mother being declared Queen of Hell, they were subjected to the heinous torture of neck and heels. After only a short time of such torment, Richard confessed to signing Satan's book, attending the witch meetings, and helping in the torment of Salem's villagers. He also, under pressure, declared his late uncle Roger Toothaker, his aunt Mary Toothaker, and his cousin Martha Carrier broke bread with the devil at the meetings. Quote, I heard Sarah Good talk of a minister or two, Richard offered. One of them was he that had been at Eastward and preached once at the village. His name is Burroughs, and he is a little man. End quote. When asked who else was at Satan's feast, Richard Carrier provided a long list. Nurse, Howe, Bishop, and Wilds, already executed, and prisoners Willard, the Proctors, the Corys, and Bradbury. He admitted to the torment of several people. One of them, surprisingly, was Reverend Paris's wife, who had been ill a long time. It was the first time Elizabeth Paris's name had come up in the trials, and one wonders if Abigail Williams suggested her aunt's maladies. Richard Carrier was returned to jail, where John Proctor heard that Richard had testified against him. In a fury, realizing his trial date was imminent, he fought for his life. Along with some of the other prisoners, he drafted a letter from jail addressed to the Boston magistrates specifically to increase Mather, James Allen, John Bailey, Samuel Willard, and Joshua Moody, alerting them that the two carrier boys had been tied neck and heels till the blood was ready to come out of their noses. Proctor told him his own son had received the same torture and condemned it as popish cruelties. His quill flying furiously across the page, he entreated them to hear him out. The jury and magistrates, he said, have condemned us already before our trials, being so much incensed and engaged against us by the devil. John Proctor and the other men begged the clergymen to attend their upcoming trials, hoping thereby you may be the means of saving, saving the shedding of our innocent bloods. The prisoners pleaded with the five clergy to show an enclosed letter to Governor Phipps, asking him to move their trials to Boston and have different judges other than the ones who had overseen the previous trials, sit at the bench. Governor Phipps made no move on their behalf, and the venue and magistrates remained unaltered. Petition of John Proctor from prison. Okay, remember, this stuff is written in Old English style, so here we go. <laughs> Salem Prison, July 23, 1692. Mr. Mather, Mr. Allen, Mr. Moody, Mr. Willard, and Mr. Bailey. Reverend Gentlemen, the, the innocence of our case with the enmity of our accusers and our judges and jury whom nothing but our innocent blood will serve their turn 
having condemned us already before our trials, being so much incensed and engaged against us by the devil, makes us bold to beg and implore your favorable assistance of this, our humble petition to, the, to his excellency, that if it be possible, our innocent blood may be spared, which undoubtedly otherwise will be shed, if the Lord doth not mercifully step in. The magistrates, ministers, juries, and all the people in general, being so much enraged and incensed against us by the delusion of the devil, which we can term no other, by reason we know in our own consciences we are all innocent. Here are five persons who have lately confessed themselves to be witches, and do accuse some of us of being along with them at a sacrament since we were committed in a close, in a close prison, which we know to be lies. Two of the five are carrier sons, young men, who would not confess anything till they tied them neck and heels till the blood was ready to come out of their noses, and tis credibly believed and reported. This was the occasion of making them confess that they never did by reason they said. One had been a witch a month and another five weeks, and that their mother had made them so, who has been confined here this nine weeks. My son William Proctor, when he was examined, because he would not confess that he was guilty when he was innocent, they tied him neck and heels till the blood gushed out of his nose, and would have kept him so twenty-four hours, if one more merciful than the rest had not taken pity on him and caused him to be unbound. These actions are very like the popish cruelties. They have already undone us in our estates, and that will not serve, or serve their turns. Without our innocent bloods, with our innocent blood. Sorry about that. If it cannot be granted that we can have our trials at Boston, we humbly beg that you endeavor to have these magistrates changed and others in their rooms. Begging also and beseeching you would be pleased to be here, if not all. Some of you at our trials, hoping thereby you may be the means of saving and, and, she, and, and uh, the shedding of our innocent bloods. Desiring your prayers to the Lord in our behalf, we rest your poor afflicted servants, John Proctor, etc. And this is from Robert Caleb. This is the book, Robert Caleb, More Wonders of the Invisible World, London, 1700. Excerpt in Burr, Narratives of the Witchcraft Cases, pages 362-364. Only days before the court of Oyer and Terminer was to reconvene in Salem Town, Gedney, Corwin, Higginson, and Corwin ordered the arrest of Martha Emerson of Haverhill, and her mother, Mary Toothaker of Berlurk. I think it's Berlurk. Ber Berlurica. I was going to say Berlurica, but it's, it's Berlurica. Probably have it wrong. These arrests followed, followed hard on the testimonies and confessions of the Lacys and Fosters. Three other warrants were issued for witches, accused of torturing Elizabeth Ballard and Timothy Swan. One of the newly arrested, Mary Tyler Post Bridges of Andover, confessed Martha confessed. Martha Emerson, the toothaker's daughter, also confessed and named her Aunt Martha Carrier as a witch. When Mary Ellen Toothaker was questioned on July 30th, two days before the court convened, she alluded to the stress of the Indian Wars as part of her detached mental state. This may last, she said. I was under great discontentedness and trouble with fear about the Indians, and used often to dream of fighting with them. She said the devil had appeared to her in the shape of a tawny man and promised to keep her from the Indians, and she should have happy days with her son, who was casually who was a casualty of the Indian Wars. Quote, he promised if I would serve him, I would be safe from the Indians, and it was that fear of the Indians that put me upon it, the signing of the devil's book. Ironically, Two days later, as Mary Toothacker sat in Salem jail, a small party of Indians attacked, uh, attacked. I'm sorry. <laughs> Why is it I'm having trouble with this word? B-I-L-L-E-R-I-C-A. Sorry about that. We're just going to go with that. The inhabitants of two houses neighboring her own were butchered. Had she not been in prison, she too would be dead. Mary must have felt the devil had kept his promise to her and saved her from the attack. Perhaps, due to that covenant, she never did retract her confession. The declarations of the five Andover prisoners, stating that all five of the recently hanged women 
had indeed been among the witches at the devil's sacrament. Gave the magistrates great relief. Here was proof that they had not executed the innocent. If anything, it fueled their resolve for the next set of trials. Specifically, in their crosshairs were George Burroughs and Martha Carrier. The third session of the court of Oyer and Terminer. On Tuesday, August 2nd, 1692, the court was again in session. There was a feeling akin to electrical charges surging through the room. The promise of more executions, too terrifying to admit to, ravaged the congregation's consciousness like ravenous wolves. The stars of the show were seated in the front row of the Salem Town House, prim and proper in their white collars, aprons, and caps. A more unlikely lynch mob was never imagined, yet the power they wielded inside that cavernous courtroom would have impressed any leader of war. The trials lasted four days. Martha Carrier went first on August 2nd and 3rd June. John Willard, George Jacobs Sr., and John and Elizabeth Proctor were tried between the 3rd and the 5th. George Burroughs was saved for last and was tried on August 5th. During these trials, the magistrates also heard testimony against Mary Etsy and Martha Corey. These two women were indicted from the evidence presented against them for their attacks on Mercy Lewis and Elizabeth Hubbard back in May. They were returned to jail to await their formal trials a month later in September. Martha Carrier's Trial We have Cotton Mather to thank for recording his thoughts on what happened during Martha Carrier's trial, as all the transcripts have been lost to time. Mather referred to her as the rampant hag. The trials were no different than the others. As far as the structure of them went, depositions were read from Martha's May, th May 31st examination. The chaos that ensued at her exam was recalled. The torment of the girls had been so great that the magistrates had ordered Carrier's hands bound. Thomas Putnam Jr. was only too happy to remind the court of this, as he said, had not the honored magistrates commanded her to be bound. We were ready to think she would quickly have killed some of them. Elizabeth Hubbard, Mary Walcott, and Mercy Lewis all testified concerning Carrier's unrelenting torture. Abigail Williams and Ann Putnam Jr. added their sordid stories of Carrier's witch coming to their homes and tormenting them. Even a young 12-year-old girl from Andover testified she had recently been attacked by the specters of Martha Carrier and her son Richard. Goody Carrier's tongue had done its own damage. Reports reminding the court of how Carrier had made fun of the girl's afflictions were presented. One witness spoke up and told of the time she spoke with Carrier the previous spring. The woman had told Martha that a, that a maid had reported seeing Carrier Specter outside Ingersoll's ordinary and that her neck was twisted almost round. To this, Martha remarked coldly, It is no matter of, of her neck. Okay, of her neck. This is, see, this is what I'm dealing with, okay? It is no matter of her neck. Ne her, the neck is spelled N-I-C-K-E. Had been quite off if she said it was there. Neighbors, and even her nephew, Alan Toothaker, testified against her. The Lacey's and Foster statements concerning seeing Martha at the Devil's Sacraments carried a lot of weight, possibly because these were new depositions taken only a few days prior. It gave the illusion that nothing had changed and Carrier was still about Satan's business. To seal that concept, Susanna Sheldon reenacted the pretty little trick she had produced at Martha's examination in May. She showed how her hands were uncomfortably tied together and accused Carrier Specter of the deed. It came as no surprise that Martha Carrier was convicted. If she left the courtroom without incident or railed at her accusers, it was not noted. John Willard's trial. On May 18th, John Willard had been examined and indicted of witchcraft charges for torturing Mercy Lewis, Ann Putnam Jr., Abigail Williams, and Elizabeth Hubbard. Ann Carr Putnam told many of the ghosts, told, told okay, sorry, Ann Carr, <laughs> Ann Carr Putnam told of the many ghosts that had hovered in her bedchamber, claiming Willard had murdered them. The written depositions from that exam show the names of Samuel Paris, Thomas Putnam Jr., and Nathaniel Ingersoll as the supporters of the girls' claims. Sarah Bibber also joined in with tales of affliction and witnessing Willard's specter attack Mercy Lewis and Mary Walcott on May 17th. Much of the damning testimony concerned Willard's spectral attacks on the Wilkins family, to which Daniel Wilkins finally succumbed, 
and Bray Wilkins was hounded. Once again, Ann Jr., Mercy Lewis, and Mary Walcott were the star accusers. They had witnessed Willard's ghost sitting on Daniel Wilkins' chest until the youth could not breathe. Other Wilkins' relatives reported being tortured by the hands of his specter appearing in their rooms, threatening them. Richard Carrier, newly confessed wizard, was called in to repeat his accusations against the man. Carrier, who had named Willard on July 22nd a being among those at the Devil's Picnic in the Parsonage, had accurately described John Spector as a black-haired man of middle stature. The usual accusations followed, and he was convicted and sentenced to hang. John and Elizabeth Proctor's Trials The depositions against John Proctor would have filled a wooden crate. Each one of the afflicted people, either themselves or through their adult supporters, filed a complaint against Proctor. The usual accounts of spectral pinching, choking, pressing upon, etc. were levied against him. Some of the documents, including his wife Elizabeth, who was also on trial this day, and even his son William and daughter Sarah. The Putnam names were affixed to many of them, as was that of Reverend Samuel Paris. It was probably now that John Proctor regretted all the times he ridiculed the afflicted girls and called their antics juggler's tricks. The words he had uttered all those months ago to Samuel Sibley about beating the jade, Mary Warren, and trying her to the spinning wheel until the foolishness left her came back to haunt him now. Sibley's deposition was dated the day of Proctor's trial. How often had he looked at these delusional girls and shaken his head in disbelief that grown adults were giving credence to their outbursts. He had even gone to Salem Village to drag his maid Mary back home after she spent the night at Ingersoll's after testifying in court. Now, he looked at their smug faces and heard his name, screamed, and he knew he was doomed. Statement of Samuel Sibley versus John Proctor. Here we go. The morning after the examination of Goody Nurse, I'm sorry, August 5th, 1692. The morning after the examination of Goody Nurse, Sam Sibley met John Proctor about Mr. Phillips without call to say, I'm, I'm just W dash, oh, I don't know, to say Sibley as he was going to said, to said Phillips and asked how the folks did at the village. He answered he heard there were, that they were very bad last night, but he had heard nothing this morning. Proctor replied he was going to fetch home his jade. He left her there last night and had rather given... 40D, then let her come up, said Sibley, asked why he told, so Proctor replied. If they were let alone, so should we all be devils and witches quickly, they should rather be had to do the whipping post, but he would fetch his jade home and thresh the devil out of her, and more to the like purpose, crying, hang them, hang them. And also added that when she was first taken with fits, he kept her close to the wheel and threatened to thrash her. And then she had no more fits till the next day. He, he was gone forth. And then she must have she must have her fits again for sooth and Gerat and Curia Proctor. Owens, he met Mary Warren at test. Okay, and there's an uh, asterisk with uh, S.T. Sewell Clerk. Thirty-nine men submitted a signed petition to the magistrates, declaring they could not understand why God would let such a tragedy afflict the proctors. They wrote as to what we have ever seen or heard of them. Upon our consciousness, we judged them innocent of the crime rejected. More than just a testament to the proctors' character, the document attacked the spectral evidence so prevalent in the trials. Petition for John Proctor and Elizabeth Proctor, August 5, 1692. The humble and sincere declaration of us, subscribers and inhabitants in Ipswich on behalf of our neighbors, John Proctor and his wife, now in trouble and under suspicion of witchcraft. To the Honorable Court of Assistance, now sitting in Boston, honored and right worshipful, the forested, the forested John Proctor may have great reason to justify the divine sovereignty of God under those severe remarks of providence upon his peace in honor, under a due reflection upon his life, past upon his life past, and so the best of us have reason to adore the great pity and indulgence of God's providence that we are not exposed to the utmost shame 
that the devil can invent under the permission of sovereignty. Though not for the sin for named, yet or many transgressions. For we do at present suppose that it may be a method within the severe but just transaction of the infinite majesty of God that he sometimes may permit Satan, probably Satan, to personate, dissemble, and thereby abuse innocence, and such as do in the fear of God defy the devil and all his works. The great rage he has permitted to attempt holy job, Job, to attempt holy Job, with the abuse he does the famous Samuel, in disquieting his silent dust, by shadowing his venerable person, in answer to the harms of witchcraft, in other instances from good hand, from good hands, maybe er, argued besides the unsearchable footsteps of God's judgments that are brought to light every morning, that astonish or weaker, or weaker reasons, to teach us adoration, trembling, and dependence. But we must not trouble your honor by being tedious. Therefore, we being smitten with the notice of what has happened, we reckon it within the duties of our charity that teacheth us to do as we would uh, as we would be done by, to offer thus much for the clearing of our neighbors in the sense of his, that we never had the least knowledge of such a nefarious wickedness in our said neighbors since they have been within our acquaintance. Neither do we remember any such thoughts in us concerning them, or any action by them or either of them directly trending that way, no more than might be in the lives of any other persons of the, clear, of, of the clearest reputation as to any such evils. What God may have left them to, we cannot go into. God's pavilions clothed with clouds of darkness round about. But as to what we have ever seen or heard of them, upon our consciousness, we judge them innocent of the crime rejected. His, 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 his breeding hath been amongst us, and was of religious parents in our place, and by reason of relations and properties within our town, hath had constant intercourse with us. We speak upon our personal acquaintance and observations, and so leave our neighbors, and this our testimony on their behalf, to the wise thoughts of your honors, and subscribe. John O. Wise, William Story, Senior Th Thomas Choate, John Burnham, Senior William Thompson, Dolo Satter, Isaac Foster. There's um, asterisk near these names, so I'm thinking that the spelling is off. Uh, William Goodhue, John Cogswell, Thomas Andrews, Joseph Andrews, Benjamin Marshall, Isaac, per Isaac Perkins, Nathaniel Perkins, Thomas Lovekin, William Cogswell, Thomas Varney, John Fellows, William Cogswell again. So we see that again. Um, Williams Cogswell, okay. William Cogswell, send Jonathan Cogswell, John Cogswell Jr., John Andrews, Joseph Proctor, Samuel Gidding, John Andrews. Uh, Jer William Butler, William Andrews, Joseph Hewlett, James White, even with the deposition in their favor, listing the good men of Ipswich and Salem Village, which included the signature of Reverend John Wise, the words of small girls testifying to poppets, devil's feasts, and specters flying about in the shapes of the proctors carry the most weight. They were convicted of witchcraft. Elizabeth Proctor let the court know that she was expecting a child, witch or not. The Puritan could not con condemn an unborn child to hell. She was given a reprieve until the child should be delivered. No such mercy was given to John. George Jacob Sr.'s trial. No records other than the original depositions made out at George Jacob's examination remain. His servant, Sarah Churchill, would have borne witness that Jacob was be had beaten her with his walking sticks. With his walking sticks. The other girls joined him with stories of abuse. John de Rich, the same youth who claimed old Jacobs had chased him into the river in an effort to drown him, also presented accounts of several ghosts appearing to him, accusing Jacobs of murdering them. George Jacobs Sr., leaning heavily upon his walking sticks, toothless, gray and tired, listened to the accusations and watched as the girls went through the re the, 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 the repertoire of tricks. He was just as salty and argumentative 
as he had been during his examination. The notes from his exam were read, and the events remembered. Here are them that accuse you of acts of witchcraft, the magistrate said. Before he could continue, Jacobs blurted out, Well, let us hear who they are and what they are. He listened, glaring through ruby eyes as the afflicted, including newly recruited 16-year-old John DeRich, recited their stories of torture. At the completion of the litany of accusations, the magistrate spat. Who did it? Don't ask me, Jacobs fired back. As the roaring of the afflicted rose to the wooden rafters overhead, he suddenly felt the weight of the hopeless position he was in. In a chastened voice, he pleaded, Pray do not accuse me. I am as clear as your worships. When the faces from the bar remained unchanged, he rallied again and shouted, You tax me for a wizard. You may as well tax me for a buzzard. During his initial examination, the magistrates glanced over on, over the depositions before them and came to rest on a hopeful loophole. They asked him why it had been reported he did not regularly hold family prayer. The old man shouted, Because I cannot read. Well, surely, the magistrate said, the net closing in on the poor man, everyone knows the Lord's Prayer. Pray, recite it for us. George Jacobs, walking canes quivering beneath his unsteady weight, tried in vain to recite the famous prayer without faltering. It was one of the tricks inside the witch's bag. The court had it ready. Perhaps the only mercy shown to George Sr. was the court's declaration that his granddaughter Margaret, who had confessed to witchcraft and accused Jacob of unsavory acts, had recently recanted her confession and wanted his forgiveness. The old man's heart must have felt the only joy that horrid day offered. Her soul would be saved, if not her life. He was convinced of witchcraft. He was convicted of witchcraft and taken back to jail. Before the day of his execution, he changed his will to include Margaret, just in case she was spared. George Burroughs' trial. The last trial was that of George Burroughs. How it must have rankled him to walk into the court where he had once faced accusations from John Putnam for owning him, for owing him money, to feel the eyes of the Putnams and the other Salem villagers he had deserted when acting as their minister must have felt galling and now terrifying. The short, dark-complexioned man approached the bar. His trial had attracted the largest crowd. Among them, adding to the air of importance in this particular position, was Deodat Lawson and Increase Mather from Boston. Reverend John Hale had ridden down from Beverly. As the jury and magistrates took their seats, a heightened feeling of excitement could be felt in the room. This was not just another suspected witch. This man was accused of being the ringleader of the coven, trying to take over not only Essex County, but all of New England churches. If George Burroughs was indeed Satan's right-hand man, was he also not responsible for the slaughtering of, vill of villagers at the hands of the Indians? Had he had a hand in spectrally thwarting the attempts of the militia to stop the warfare? His evil efforts may have even delayed the speedy return of a charter that could have steered a better course through the chaos now inflicted in the area. Worst of all, he had posed as a minister, a man of God, and spouted his heresies from the pulpit. In short, all perceived evils seemed to be wrapped up in this one stout man from Maine. It was afternoon on August 5th when the afflicted stood, one by one, to repeat their depositions of abuse. The court heard how Burroughs had once bragged of being a wizard, not just a mere witch. The usual litany of accusations of being pinched, tormented, and pressured to sign his book and even biting were put forth. When the subject of biting came up, several of the girls presented their arms, showing bite marks. Here, like the poppets, was something tangible. The magistrates jumped on it. They had Burroughs put his teeth against the marks to see if they fit. In fairness, they had a few other men do the same. According to the triumphant judges, only Burroughs' teeth fit the marks. Tangible proof. Not just seeing things flying around in the invisible world. Yet, it was Burroughs' specter who had bitten them. Did they now have the proof that they needed, that spectral evidence was real? As anyone could see the bite marks, and the pretty little man had been the only one who seemed capable of making them. The afflicted roared and felt convulsing to the floor throughout the proceedings, especially when Burroughs was speaking or testimony was being given. It was clear their pain increased when he was questioned. Chief Justice William Stoughton 
asked the little minister who he thought was hindering the witnesses. Burroughs responded that it was probably the devil. Stoughton retorted, How comes the devil so loath to have any testimony born against you? George had no answer. The next performance offered by the afflicted was one that must be admired. If a fakery then, it was the one that they had practiced before the trial. For suddenly, all of the bench of afflicted victims froze and went into a trance state. They all stared at the same spot, somewhere between Burroughs and themselves. The magistrates repeatedly asked them what was wrong, but none answered. Only, sta only stared without blinking at one place. Then, as if on cue, they awoke and fell back in terror. Quickly, the judges ordered them separated in a, into other rooms, where each was asked what had just happened. Each girl, without the prodding of the others, recounted the same thing. There had been four ghosts glaring with red eyes at Burroughs and accusing him of their murders. The girls identified the ghosts as Burroughs' first two wives, and the wife and daughter of Diodat Lawson. This departure from the usual process of letting the girls all scream out their accusations as a group is significant. The judges seem to have taken the uh, <clears throat> seem to have taken the, the, the oh man the, the admonitions. The judges see, judges seem to have taken the ad admonitions of the several ministers and others to heart. Not only did they have Burroughs test his teeth marks against those found on the girls' arms, they for the first time were separating them to get a fair accounting. It was obvious they were taking extra precautions to get in right with this prisoner and make sure their findings were irrefutable. When the judges related their findings to the packed courtroom, Burroughs hotly denied seeing any ghosts. What must Diodat Lawson have thought in hearing the deserting minister was responsible for the deaths of his late wife and daughter? The same deaths that many had felt were just retribution for Lawson himself leaving the ranks as minister of Salem Village. Burroughs stood at the bar and listened as villager after villager accused him of everything from presenting with poppets and thorns to torment others, to neglecting prayer and not baptizing his own children. Reports that he had treated his wives harshly, almost to the point of death, were blurted into the courtroom. No less than eight confessed witches, no less than eight of the confessed witches stood and told of how he had tricked them into signing his book and attending the parsonage picnics. These confessed witches, now joining the afflicted girls in their screaming, added to the overall deafening noise that meant almost everything said that afternoon. Merchants going about their business in the streets of Salem Town must have paused in shock at the shrieks coming from the stately townhouse. And then came the li lineup of people attesting to the minister's supernatural strength. Men, heads taller than Burroughs, stood and told of how they had witnessed or heard of second hand that Burroughs had lifted a heavy gun with a seven-foot barrel with only one hand in preparation for firing it at Casco Bay during the Indian attacks. He had, so they said, also lifted a large weighty barrel of molasses from a canoe, again with one hand. Nine people testified of his unusual strength, their testimonies growing more ludicrous, ending with a man stated, with men stating Burroughs had lifted the heavy gun, reported on by placing only his finger into the gun barrel and hoisting it up. This last report was allow allowed to slide. Burroughs was allowed to respond to the allegations. He scoffed at the molasses barrel story, and as for the gun, he answered with two versions. The first was that he had picked it up before the gun's lock and pressed the butt of the gun into his chest to study it. He then added that an Indian had steadied the long gun barrel for him, obviously an Indian on their side of the warfare. None of the accusers remembered seeing an Indian helping him. Some of the Gloucester men and Mrs. Roger Toothacre, also accused of witchcraft, claimed they saw specters helping Burroughs hold the gun. As expected, John Putnam bore witness about Burroughs borrowing money from him for his late wife Hannah's funeral costs in 1681. The earlier reports given at his examination concerning the strawberry picking expedition where he seemed to have preternatural hearing, his treatment of his second wife, Sarah, during her bed rest after childbirth that resulted in her death were all laid out. Burroughs objected to each accusation and tried to offer his explanation of the events. They seemed trivial and baseless, a desperate man with desperate answers. Burroughs looked into the wooden face of John Hawthorne and saw the brother-in-law of his second wife, Sarah, the same Sarah, 
He had just been accused of causing her death through harsh treatment. He could practically see the shadow of the hangman's noose against the beams. George Burroughs' final attempt to save himself from the gallows came in the form of a quote from a controversial book by Thomas Aidey entitled The Candle in the Dark. It basically refuted the witch's, the, the witch's existence and that it was impossible to detect witchcraft or sign a contract with the devil and send others to do his bidding. When the magistrates accused him of quoting from the book that was held in disdain by many societies, Burroughs at first denied it and then admitted he had seen the passage in the book, but he didn't actually own the book, merely transcribed it. His, <clears throat> his rendering on the book's passage only added fuel to the fire. Why was he trying to distance himself from a book that flew in the face of Puritan beliefs? He even claimed the word witch in the Bible was a different meaning than that used by the English today. After listing all the all the Burroughs' contradictions and falsehood, the verdict by the jury came back, guilty. A great howl of approval rose from the confessed witches in the audience, and the usual lineup of afflicted victims who had been accusing their neighbors since February. Reverend Increase Mather, seated among the agitated throng of spectators, admitted that based on what he had heard and seen that sweltering August afternoon, had I been one of the judges, he said, I could not have acquitted him. Burroughs had one last thing to offer as he was let out of the chaos. He claimed he would die due to false witness, witnesses. While his statement may have felt like hollow words any condemned man would swear to, it bothered Reverend John Hale and approached one of the confessed witches, we don't know which one, and said, you are one that bring this man to death. If you have charged anything upon him that is not true, recall it before it be too late. While he is still alive, the answer was it. The answer came. She merely stated she had nothing for which to blame herself. For John Hale, a reverend and a man of cloth, it may have been harder to believe a fellow clergyman, whom he may have himself heard preach, could be aligned with the devil. He had heard of Burroughs's many great works in Maine. He had saved many lives from brutal Indian attacks and administered to the sick and homeless. Could this man, so short in stature, that it was hard to see him held up as a demonic king be guilty of the things of which he stood accused of. What did this say for all clergymen? Were any of them safe from the temptations of evil? Had not the original witch outbreak begun in Reverend pa Paris's very household? What was the deciding factor in George Burroughs' verdict? Was it the physical evidence of the bite marks? Was it the sequestered questioning of the girls who reported ghosts who murdered victims condemning the man? It was probably the sum of the parts. Six people had already hanged. Could they, with the ringleader in their grasp, ever conceivably let him go? He would hang from the gallows in two weeks' time. All right, guys, that's it. That's where we're ending. We will continue with this on Sunday. Wow. That's a lot of trial, a lot of accusations, a lot of fake stuff going on. But uh, we'll continue with this on Sunday. Thank you, everybody, for coming. I know we started late tonight. I apologize. Um, tomorrow, Nancy Mance is going to be with us. We're going to be talking about twin flames and, uh, and and things like that. And we're really going to go into detail about them. And I think it's going to be a very interesting discussion. That'll be our usual time at 6.30 p.m. Pacific. So check us out tomorrow at 6.30 p.m. Pacific. If you like the show, share it with five people. If you hated the show, share it with five of your enemies. Uh, we are equal opportunity here at California House Radio. And show me some love, you know. If you're on, if you're on Facebook and uh, you feel the desire to follow, please do. Please do follow us. We have a lot of different topics on this show. And uh, like I said earlier, I think there's something for everybody if you go check out our past shows. So, uh, yeah, go ahead and follow me. Uh, if you're watching from YouTube, please uh, hit that like button. And uh, if you haven't already... Please hit that subscribe button because we're always looking for followers all the way around, subscribers and followers. Anyhow, I want to thank you all for coming tonight. I really appreciate it. And uh, I will see you guys tomorrow at 6.30 p.m. Pacific. And uh, have a good night. Bye.